All right, well, thank you and good morning, everyone. So I will be talking about composing nonlinear solvers for optimization problems. And in particular, for some context, I'll be looking at nonlinear preconditioning and using this for tensor approximation problems. This is work with my PhD supervisor, Hans de Sterk, formerly of University of Waterloo, now at Monash University in Australia. So as a bit of a brief outline, there'll be a short introduction on what I'm talking about, the whole composing nonlinear solvers. I'll spend a fair bit of time developing the whole tensor approximation problem, as this is what my research is focused on thus far. Following that, I'll be talking about the ideas of additive and multiplicative composition, and then the idea of nonlinear preconditioning, both left and right, and illustrate this by using NCG and nonlinear GM res. Then finally, time permitting, a brief numerical example. So as some of you may have seen in a recent SIAM review paper, not in the current issue, but the one previously, there was an article discussing how nonlinear algebraic solvers can be combined to solve a nonlinear system of equations, g of x equals zero. And in this paper, there was a particular emphasis on problems that were obtained from discretizing PDEs. And my re supervisor and myself were more interested in the case of how these strategies can be applied to optimization problems. There's a number of different reasons why we can do this. The most obvious would be that it can improve robustness, it can offer faster convergence, and it may also offer a more tractable problem that we can work with. This is related to the idea of offering more balanced nonlinearities. And as I mentioned previously, the problem of interest for myself is the Tucker tensor approximation problem. So now I'll spend a few slides to develop this idea. So a tensor for my purposes is simply a multi-dimensional array. I'll use the scripty x to indicate it. The tensor order is the number of dimensions. For purposes here, you can think of a three-dimensional array, a cube or a box of numbers. A tensor fiber is a order one tensor or a vector with a particular orientation, which we obtain by fixing all indices but one. Here's a very popular image from a review paper on tensors illustrating column, row, and two fibers. The mode and matricization of a tensor, which I denote by this bold x sub n, takes the mode and fibers of our tensor as the columns of this matrix. And finally, the multilinear rank of a tensor is just the n-tuple of the ranks of the various mode and matricizations. So just like matrices, we can multiply by another matrix by the, on the left or the right, so long as it has conforming dimensions. Similarly, we can multiply a tensor in any mode by a matrix with conforming dimensions. So the n mode product of a tensor S and a matrix U is X, which is obtained by this formula, which if you want to take the time and look at it, is pretty much we're multiplying the rows of U by the columns or the fibers, the mode N fibers of S. So that is the multiplication in mode N the Tucker decomposition is simply writing a tensor X as a multilinear product of a core tensor S and matrices multiplying each of the different N modes. A very, or a particular useful example of the Tucker decomposition is the higher order SVD, which is a bit of a generalization of the matrix SVD. A tensor X has an HOSVD with matrices U and a core tensor S where all our matrices are orthogonal. And the core tensor is not diagonal, unfortunately, but it has some nice properties. We have orthogonal subtensors. And the subtensors are also ordered in order of decreasing magnitude in Frobenius norm. We're also able to truncate this a bit and give a compact higher order SVD. So if capital R sub n is greater than or equal to the corresponding multi part component of the multilinear rank, truncating S to S hat, where it's in R1 through Rn, and the matrix C's Un to In by Un, this gives a compact representation. 
So the tensor approximation problem, we're given a tensor x. This is some data from some, it can be from recorded observations, output from code, what have you. We want to compute an approximation x hat, which is cheaper to store, and hopefully we'll extract some relevant information from x. If we want to express x hat in the HOSVD format, we will solve the optimization problem. We minimize over the components of the decomposition the difference between x and our approximation in the squared Frobenius norm. And as we want our factor matrices to be orthogonal, we have these orthogonality constraints. I won't go to get into the details here, but due to some nice properties of this problem, we're able to reformulate it as this maximization problem where we can omit the core tensor S and only have to worry about our matrices U. The most common or the workhorse algorithm for solving this problem is known as the higher order orthogonal iteration. In this case, if we let WN be this particular product, we have our mode N matricization and a Kronecker product of all but the U sub or the U little n matrices. If we matricize this whole tensor product, we can find that it is equal to U n transpose times W n. And that is very, if we assume that all the components of W n, all this is fixed, this is very simple to solve and we can solve for U n in alternating fashion simply by taking the leading left singular vectors of Wn. And I'll let the Hoy or higher order orthogonal iteration, this is just one iteration giving an update for our factor matrices. Now, while this is the most commonly used iteration, it can also be very slow to converge in practice. So we're looking at ways of improving this somehow. If we want to use a more general optimization method, say just something using gradients, hessians, what have you, we have some other issues that we need to take care of. For our objective function, we have to deal with the fact that there is norm invariance under orthogonal transformations. So we can multiply tensor x by our orthogonal matrices and it will not change the value of the norm. So this means that our decomposition will not be unique. And furthermore, we still have those orthogonal to make sure we're addressing those as well. A nice way to handle all these issues is to use matrix manifold optimization, in particular on the Grassmann manifold. So the Grassmann manifold NP is a set of p-dimensional linear subspaces of our N. For something a little bit more concrete, we can specify an element of a Grassmann manifold by the column space of Y or some orthonormal matrix Y in our NP. So because of this, we can identify the Grassmann manifold. Here Y is orthonormal and this equivalence class is a set of Y times M or M is So we identify the Grassmann manifold with a set of So if we can problem from the previous page, but now we're looking at the Grassmann manifold pretty much, except here our matrix UN represents an entire equivalent. Because of this, we have and the orthogonal by the manifold. It's an unconstrained optimization problem as well. So there's no free lunch. There's always a trade-off when we're doing things. There are some particular issues we need to keep in mind when we're working on a manifold. We consider tangent vectors, which are possible directions of movement along the manifold. And to move in the direction of a tangent vector, we require what is known as a retraction map, which describes a curve along said manifold. We also can't compare tangent vectors at different points directly. Because of this, we want to make use of vector transport mappings, which is capital T sub Y here. To find a vector at a point X indicating the direction of Y, use what is known as the logarithmic map, log base X of Y. 
And finally, when we're doing our various optimization calculations, we need to adapt our gradient manifold. So gradient f of x, or nabla f of x in the UK. So I'll just use grad f of x to represent the gradient. One nice thing, though, is that if we have n matrix variables, such as in the optimization problem I'm considering, we can just work on a Cartesian product of Grassmann manifolds. And all these things just extend component-wise for each matrix. So after all this, I'm now getting back into what I was talking about in the first slide. So the composition of nonlinear solvers. For notation, I'll just let M of G, X, K describe one iteration of a solver M applied to problem or function G starting at point X, K. So one iteration of linear solver M. Nonlinear composition combines the results of two iterative solution methods, capital M and capital N. And the most obvious ways of going about this are by using additive or multiplicative combinations. And much of this will be familiar from, say, a linear case. And it is fairly straightforward. For the additive composition, we can just do a linear combination of correction terms, which will be the result of our nonlinear solver minus the input point. And this is for weights a sub m and a sub n. So linear combination of corrections. For a multiplicative composition, we can just do sequential nonlinear solves. We can do a solve with n, then a solve with m, and then repeat back and forth. So express compactly in one line like this, or as a two-line iteration like that. So that is the basic composition methods, but there's also a more interesting idea, in my opinion at least, of nonlinear programming. Uh, not programming, I'm sorry, preconditioning. So in this, we modify our function G through the application of a nonlinear solver N. And this is also motivated by the idea of linear preconditioning for linear systems. So in the case of linear left preconditioning, we replace AX minus B equals zero by P inverse AX minus B equals zero. So we left multiply by preconditioning matrix P inverse. We can write this as a fixed point iteration. We just stick a negative in front of P and X to both sides. And we look at this fixed point iteration. This has a nonlinear analog, X equals N of G and X. So rather than considering G of X, we will now consider the left preconditioned residual equation, X minus N of G X equals zero. And we solve this equation using our solver M. So rather than solve, have G here, we have I minus N of G. And a nice thing about this is that N is not explicitly required. If we end up with some fixed point iteration, X is equal to P of X, we can treat this P as N of G. So that would be our preconditioned function. As an example of this, I'll look at it applied to nonlinear conjugate gradient. So the NCG iteration solves G of X equals zero. This is a simple outline of one step, which is probably familiar to a lot of people here, so I won't go into the details. And I'll just note that our update parameter beta K can be determined by any number of possible formula. Rather than butcher the names, I'll just say I'm using the two uh, alternatives here, the beta PR and the beta HS formula. So this is our standard NCG iteration. To go to the, non, the left preconditioned version, we let P of X be N of G of X, where N is some nonlinear solver. And we define G bar to be X minus P of X. At this point, all we have to do is replace G by G bar everywhere in our NCG iteration. So our Search direction update involves G bar, as does the computations for our update parameters beta K. Now, this is the most straightforward way of going about this, but it is also possible to derive alternate beta K formulas based on the idea of linear preconditioning. So the linearly preconditioned linear CG iteration is as follows. 
we have P of G of K and P is equal to some matrix SS transpose. And we can obtain the corresponding update parameters beta by replacing G and P in the beta formula with S transpose G and S inverse P. So by doing this, we get some particular nice form, or we obtain the matrix P in our beta formulas in different locations. And if we look at these results and replace P, G, K by G bar, G bar being the result of our nonlinear left preconditioning, we can incorporate both information from our gradient and from the nonlinear residual function in the computation of our beta formulas. So these are two other alternatives for computing our update parameter. That is left preconditioning. Oh, and one last thing, because it hasn't gotten quite complicated enough. To use this on the manifolds, there are a few more tweaks that need to be made. When we are doing our search direction update, we have to use vector transport to move our previous search vector. We carry out our line search using a retraction mapping. And we define our nonlinear residual or our left pre preconditioned residual function using the logarithmic map. Furthermore, our beta formulas also are updated. We explicitly use inner products and we use vector transport mappings when necessary. In the particular case that I've been considering, the tensor approximation problem, our unknown x will just be the n tuple of matrices that we want. Our objective function will be minus one half the norm of this tensor matrix product squared. I'm minimizing rather than maximizing, hence the negative. And for our, the result of our nonlinear preconditioning will be P of x, which is one iteration of the higher order orthogonal iteration. So I'm using what is the workhorse algorithm for this problem and using that as our nonlinear preconditioner. So having looked at left preconditioning, there's also the idea of right preconditioning, which again is based off the example for linear systems. We can use the substitution x is p inverse y to obtain the problem a p inverse y is equal to b. We solve this for y and then we can substitute or make this substitution back for x. For nonlinear right preconditioning, we treat n as a nonlinear transformation once again. We can say that x will be n of g and y. So if this is what x is, then we can say g of x is equal to g of n of g and y is equal to zero. And in this case, we can use n to solve this problem and then use n to solve for x. So it works in very much the same way. To illustrate this, I'll just use nonlinear GM res, or also known as Anderson acceleration or Anderson mixing. We compute an initial point via steepest descent, and then we compute a linear combination of this tentative point and past iterates, which approximately minimizes the norm of our nonlinear equation. And if we do a particular linearization, we get a nice least squares problem, which isn't too bad to solve, which is summarized right here in the ngm res algorithm. So what I will do is I will take this steepest descent component and replace this by using a right preconditioner n. So I can let our updated tentative point be n of g and xk, or simply say p of x is n of g and xk because is less clunky. So given our nonlinear update or preconditioner function, a sequence of past iterates, we compute a improved update in the form of a linear combination. And by once we compute this update, we can also include a line search by searching in the direction of x hat from x bar. And this is summarized here in the preconditioned NGM res algorithm. And like before, there's one last tweak adapting this to the manifold context. So the g of x will be, g of x will be the Riemannian gradient of our objective function. Linearization requires ten, uh, vector transport mappings. And because we don't actually need this improved point, only the direction 
of this improved point from our tentative update, we can compute our search direction via a linear combination of logarithmic maps. And finally, our line search is carried out using the retraction mapping once again. And as in the nonlinearly preconditioned NCG case, X will be our n tuple of matrices. This is the same objective function, and we also use one iteration of Hoy as our preconditioner P of X. So for some A numerical example, at least, this is for the tensor. So we have input data, which is a collection of handwritten digits. This gives us a tensor of size 28 by 28 by 5,000, and we compute a multilinear rank approximation 14, 14, 100. So we trim down the size quite significantly. The line with circles is for Hoy, which is the most commonly used one and what we want to beat. Down here are the results of, let's see, NGM res with asterisks and NPCG with diamonds and squares for the different possibilities for our beta parameters. So we are able to beat the standard method by quite a significant amount of time, so that's great. <laughs> we also compare with some other common nonlinear solvers. We have, uh, this is LBFGS, we have NCG, and we have a Riemannian trust region method. So all of these, they have a lot of oscillations going on and seem to exhibit some trouble. The trust region method does converge, but it does take a significant amount of time. And just to illustrate the, the kind of tensor data that I'm talking about, the top row is our initial data, handwritten images of the digit five. These are the images reproduced by our tensor approximation. These are some noisy input data that we used when using the, when computing these results on this slide. And these are the images that we recovered from this noisy data using our tensor approximation. So it's not the best in image recovery or whatnot, but I still think it's pretty neat for what the problem is. And that is it, so thank you very much for listening.